Britain's biggest teaching union says businesses have too much influence in the classroom. Their power needs to be curbed. The National Union of Teachers says UK-wide guidelines are needed to prevent students being manipulated by advertising. Companies say they're providing schools with much needed financial help. Right, so this is a typical bank branch, would you say? This is a lesson Similar in personal finance at a sixth form college. The teacher and all the materials are from the bank NatWest. Around 65% of schools in the UK have taken up the bank's offer to come into their classrooms to deliver their Money Sense programme. More businesses are offering to help schools like this that are often looking at ways to plug holes in their budgets. We've got paying in machines and we've got ATMs. Teaching unions are concerned businesses might use these opportunities to manipulate students with marketing messages. Here, NatWest insists its programme is totally impartial and the school says it's not about budgets, it's about providing a valuable extra resource. But not all schools are happy to be involved with business. This primary school was approached by a company offering education products. They were asking us to, um, to send information out to our parents um, that they would be able to offer extra support to our children and that there would be some benefits for the school. Um, certainly that was something I, I didn't pursue at all. Teaching unions say UK-wide guidelines are needed to curb businesses' influence in classrooms. We think schools need clear guidance on how sponsorship, how commercial companies can be involved in schools. We welcome the involvement of companies in schools, but there have to be clear limits on what they're allowed to do. Schools are potentially a huge prize for advertisers. Marketeers estimate that adverts in UK schools would reach 10 million pupils, a million teachers and 13 million parents. Fizzy drinks and snack food advertising has been banned in schools, but over the years businesses have used other marketing methods, including sunscreen manufacturers giving pupils material on sun safety, detergent companies providing their product for science projects on stain removal, even schools being paid to send out advertising messages on headed school paper. The Scottish government introduced guidelines to stem any creeping influence of business in classrooms. What we wanted to do was to set out some clear guidelines for schools as to whether they should firstly accept commercial sponsorship and if they did, what the parameters of that should be. But businesses say industry guidelines already exist and teachers can decide what's right. Most of the big successful programmes that are in this area are, have been developed through relationships between education, between schools uh, and businesses where there is clear educational value for it and there's also benefit for those organisations but it's not about direct selling of products or um, services. Just to make sure you can do it. While Scotland has opted for guidelines, there's a disjointed approach elsewhere. The Westminster government says schools have complete freedom over the teaching materials they use and teachers should use their common sense. In other words, no new guidelines. Keith Doyle, BBC News. Well, Brian Roberts, who's an expert on how companies sell their brands, will be here in a few minutes' time. Let's take you back to the story about businesses getting their products into the classroom now. Teaching unions say it's on the increase and the rules need to be tightened up. Well, Brian Roberts is a brand expert with the consultancy Kantar Retail. Very good morning to you. Now, good morning. Uh, the, the NET is calling for guidelines. The, the words they use, there's a, a creeping influence of advertisers in schools. Uh, is that something the industry is aware of? Uh, very much so. And I think you know, there's, there's sort of whole agencies dedicated to helping brands exert their influence within you know, the educational environment. So it's something which brands are very aware of as an opportunity for speaking to both um, young consumers and also their parents. And I think you know, that's why there is some concern from uh, teachers that you know, we might be at the thin end of the wedge of actually um, you know, marketing getting a lot more explicit within the um, educational environment. Yes, now the, the, the supermarkets or, or whatever these businesses are say quite reasonably there, there are gaps you know, in funding or whatever. These are things they can help with. Where's the problem? Um, yeah, if you sort of look at it from the brand's point of view, I think you know they are in a position to offer some excellent educational material, some of which may, may you know may be branded. Also, you know, for example, the big supermarket programs, so Tesco, Sainsbury's, and Morrison's, all running voucher programs for schools now, where parents can um, contribute vouchers, which bring in some much-needed uh, resources to arguably some underfunded schools. So, to a degree, though, that's slightly at arm's length, isn't it? Because that's something that's it happens in the supermarket itself. Uh, it's slightly removed from the classroom. Is that, is that the issue that sort of, when it becomes obvious within a classroom 
the, literally the branding within the classroom, which is a direct access yeah. to children. Yeah, very much. And there's you know, a number of examples of big companies, such as you know, detergent companies and um, large banks, who have branded educational materials and actually send people into the schools to educate um, children about, say, financial services or various areas of, of science. So, you know, that could be considered a concern when the, you know the brands are actually visible within the classroom. Um, and also in, in the area of sports as well, I mean, there's a, a large number of, um, say, sportswear manufacturers, and you'll see their branded basketball hoops, for example, in many school playgrounds. So, you know, th there are lots of concerns about this influence, but from a, a, perhaps from a sort of a, a teacher's point of view, they can provide some very valid and useful educational material, and also, um, you know, can help uh, ease some of the funding pressure when it comes to providing certain uh, items of school equipment. Now, supermarkets uh, and, and big businesses are very good at branding. They would only want to do this, presumably, if they thought it worked. I mean, what is, what is the evidence that, you know, putting, I don't know, a bank's logo within a classroom or has any, any kind of impact on those children, whether it's sort of immediate or long term? Or, or why, why do it at all? And is it dangerous in that respect? I think you know, one level of it is it um, affords the companies an opportunity to sort of uh, be seen to be giving something back to the community. So supermarket voucher schemes, for example, are a way of... Um, helping shoppers or also parents they generate some extra funding. So that's for their good schools. PR apart from anything yeah, else. Yeah, it fits into their sort of corporate social responsibility agendas. Uh, that said, I mean, with these voucher schemes, for example, you will see the supermarkets branding on banners outside of the schools, helping to reinforce the brand message. And obviously it will encourage, um, perhaps encourage uh, parents to choose one supermarket over another. So there's definitely a very sort of um, positive influence there. And also when it comes to, say, there's very infamous um, schemes in the 90s where you could exchange vouchers from chocolate bars or crisps for um, sports equipment or um, books. And that you know, was seen to actually be directly encouraging consumption of these products, you know, which might be argued to be sort of suboptimal from a dietary standpoint. It's very interesting. Thank you very much for your time this morning, Brian Roberts, who's a brand expert. You probably have experience of this at home. Do let us know your thoughts because it's something we're going to be discussing throughout the programme this morning. Let's take you back to the story about businesses getting their products into the classroom. Teaching unions say it's on the increase and the rules need to be tightened up. And Rachel Aston is here from the Mother's Union. Very good morning to you. Good morning. Um, I presume you have children in school. If you're... I have stepchildren. Right, yes, OK. But not in school. OK. Yeah. Um, so you don't have a kind of personal experience of children being exposed to this sort of thing in school. You're generally concerned about it, though, are you? That's right. Yes, yes. Mother's Union is, is concerned about, as your report said, how schools are being approached by businesses asking to come in and uh, perhaps through educational materials um, give children a message that is, is somehow associated to their brand. Yeah. I suppose the biggest challenge of schools is getting their hands on resources, isn't it? And especially at a time when things are tight, if a business comes along and says, we can provide these materials for you, and all that will happen is that our name will be on them, but you get them for nothing. That's a great incentive for schools, isn't it? And I can imagine for some it's hard to resist. Mm. Yes, and we believe that there are some very useful things that businesses can provide to schools. But we are concerned, though, that schools shouldn't become uh, a, a ground for a marketing opportunity. And, you know, some businesses are quite clear that they're really wanting to further their business objectives through schools by reaching children and their parents. Mm. What is the danger, though, to children? I mean, children are exposed to business names all the time. Children are very brand aware. Mm. I think the issue here is that schools are and should be places of trust and that if a school is allowing certain brands in with their logos, uh, the school is essentially endorsing it and you know, if children uh, assume that what they're told at school is, is, is the truth about things, then you know, we're concerned that they will perhaps automatically believe what, what the brands are, are saying. What happens if a school, for instance, I mean, there's lots of um, supermarkets, for instance, which encourage uh, voucher collection. Mm. What happens if a school has three or four of those uh, in its lobby? It's clearly not endorsing any particular brand. It's just saying, well, you know, children can see all sorts of different options on show. Mm. Not necessarily, no. But the problem with perhaps some of these voucher schemes is that parents have to collect an enormous amount of vouchers before they can actually get anything for the school. And you'll find that they would have had to have spent a lot more money uh, on their shopping than actually what the goods are worth. Mm. Um, I know that one union is asking for guidelines on this. Now, um, if the Mother's Union, for instance, was mm. consulted about guidelines, what sort of thing would you like to see drawn up? 
Well, there are some guidelines uh, that have been set out in Scotland mm -hmm. and they talk about proportionality and transparency and we think those are very good guidelines. So how would that work then? Um, so basically to make sure that any company who is coming in with any goods, they're very clear about what their objectives are from the start and that any um, costs to the school are far outweighed by um, uh, the, the, the benefits that weigh the costs mm. to the schools. All right, Rachel, thanks very much. Rachel Aston from the Mothers' Union. Forecast in just a few minutes. Let's take you back to the story about businesses getting their products into the classroom now. Teaching unions say it's on the increase and the rules need to be tightened. Let's talk to Martin Finn, Managing Director with the Education and Business Consultancy Edcoms, and Russell Hobby, who is General Secretary of the National Association of Head Teachers. Very good morning, morning to you both. Oh. Russell, can you give us a specific example of the kind of thing you're worried about? Well, I think that um, the area that we're most worried about is in the curriculum um, side of things, where you're presenting facts to children, uh, and if those facts aren't accurate and neutral uh, and have an agenda behind them, then I think it damages the reputation and the credibility of schools themselves. Are you talking about materials used, sponsored by a specific commercial business? Yes. or something, other, uh, something else? To a degree, yes, particularly branded materials, mm -hmm. but also when these materials are being put together, we need to be very clear and cautious that actually children are being taught, as far as we can tell, a neutral truth within a school, because um, we have expectations of what schools are about, their credibility, their neutrality, uh, which I think are really precious, and people need to be able to trust the information they're given in schools. Mm. Martin, why do banks, supermarkets, want in on our schools? I think there are lots of different reasons why they want in and each one is a, is a different case. Um, if you look at corporate social responsibility agenda that's what drives a lot of the... the so are you talking about PR? Uh, that some PR may result from it but uh, for instance a lot of businesses give people time to go and they equip them uh, with the right resources and the training to go into schools to talk about what they do, so that may be about careers, or it may actually be uh, about the business of, of, of that organisation. That's a slightly different thing though, isn't it? To invite someone in on a one-off basis to talk about, uh, you know, a, a supermarket chain is slightly different. I mean, what I'm, what I'm trying to ask in a way is, if it's altruistic, if what they're interested in doing is helping children and they've got money available, why don't they just do it without any of the branding in the schools? Um, I, I think... Uh, if you look at changes in the curriculum that have happened in the past few years, um, a lot of them have been about actually placing uh, topics particularly like science and technology in a real world context because that's what young people, where they want to learn to make the, the learning relevant. If you bring businesses in who are actually uh, sort of at that coal face, they're using that, those technologies and that science, um, they're in a position to actually contextualise that for students. But they teachers want... like that and students like that. But presumably brands wouldn't bother sponsoring this material unless the whole point was that brands were getting awareness amongst children. Isn't that the point? That th th there is some awareness, certainly, but I think if you look at, uh, for instance, energy companies, uh, a lot of the energy companies produce materials about really key issues about where we're going to get our energy from or um, how we're going to tackle climate change. Well, Russell, I mean, that's an interesting point, isn't it, that these companies have real experience that they can impart to students. They're not just teachers working in classrooms. They're, they're experts in these particular yes. fields. So, so there is a value in that, isn't there? Or are you concerned that it's, it comes from too much of a bias? Well, there is a value um, in... Um uh, young people understanding the world of work and the careers available to them and I'm 100% behind getting companies involved in schools f to, to talk about employment and careers opportunities and that side of things. But I, I mean you have to ask whether the information provided by an energy company on climate change is going to be uh, a complete picture within that. I mean with the best will in the world they believe in what they're doing um, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it but there are other facts that need to be placed. But there, there, is, there, there seems to be two different things going on here. One is talking about inviting someone in to talk about something that they have expertise in, yep. which could be questionable. The other is, if a head teacher has a, uh, someone come in and say, tell you what, I will give you 20 computers, and each one of them is going to have my letter heading on the top of it, what are you going to do? I mean, that, that's a real issue. What, what do you do then? Do you say, can't take it because it's got your thing on, or not? I mean, how, what do you do? I think that uh, schools have to make those decisions for themselves and they, there are structures in place that allow that to happen. That's through senior leadership teams, well, yeah. uh, through the okay. governing well, body. I understand so there's what, a process, are, but what, what's, on what basis should you make that decision? I mean, it's there. It's, it's just, it's just a, a logo. 
What's the argument? I mean, you either say yes, I accept advertising effectively in school, or not. Um, I don't think, in a way, that's for me to comment on, because that's not what our business does. And I'm a school governor, and uh, I know that those are issues that are very real. Would and you, you say no? To make those As a decisions. school governor, would you say no? Um, on that particular issue, depending on what, what it, the, the product was and what the relationship was, then you would have to make that decision by collective discussion because it would change from school to school depending on... Well, Russell, what would your advice be on that? The example you gave, if it's a small logo from a company that, that feels um, to be doing ethical work uh, for 20 computers, if I was ahead, I'd be very tempted by that one. If it was a big splash screen coming up every time someone logged in selling them fizzy drinks or something, I'd say no. Um, so it is a case-by-case -case so example. And it's product-based. So if, if those 20 computers would pursue that, that notion, whether that's realistic or not, if it had the name of a fizzy drink above it, you're saying that would be the, that would be the nature. You'd say no, because it's got a, it's got a, pr a specific product name on it. That, um, that is also a product that I think is, is potentially unhealthy or uh, it would be a negative influence on, on the children and it would depend on the prominence of the logo uh, and so on. So it's definitely a grey area, but, but I would is, uh, urge caution. I would err on the side of, if I had any doubts, I would say no to that. But isn't, doesn't this all boil down then to common sense? I mean, you say, you know, for instance, if an energy company was presenting information on climate change, you'd be concerned about you know, how unbiased that might be. But then that's down to the common sense of the science teacher, isn't it? That you use those resources and you present different information from different sources as well. Yes, uh, and I, I'm not, I don't actually think we need guidelines from the government on this one. What I think is we need guidelines from schools getting together amongst themselves because, mm. you know, one school may have had experience of, of a corporate environment, another school may not have done. So I'm not asking government to get involved here. I think schools themselves can come up and say, this is what we think is sensible and this is what our associations have come together mm. uh, uh, and said. Um, that being said, there are tactics and strategies that go on in the world of, of the corporate environment which schools are just not aware of in terms of product placement, uh, in terms of the sales strategies that 